So what I realized about um, Teddy Roosevelt is that he didn't like music and didn't know music well either, and I thought, well, that's good. And, <laughs> uh, what kind of paper did he have? He was he had a perfect ear for bird song. Uh, and he, I think because he couldn't see and didn't get glasses until he was 12, when he started out writing as a boy, he tries to mimic bird song, he even tries to do the notation. So the first part of the book is about uh, Roosevelt and bird song. Uh, and I'm going to start with him in that sort of quasi-scientific mode. And he ends his life writing about this trip to Brazil in kind of scientific mode, too. I'm not sure quite all that I'm going to do with that. Uh, but what I want to say about nonfiction and that I'm writing these sort of biographies or biographies and literary analysis uh, about figures who were very interested and had known as nonfiction writers themselves. Uh, I guess what I want to say about that is that I find it a very rich field. Um, and if you want advice about what to do as a writer, you should kind of think things up. Find the thing you know least well uh, and pull it in to a discussion that you have in mind. Uh, and you'll find a pattern there that you never could have imagined. traumatizing, I think because I was so reassured that these people were still cared about so many years ago, some years later. So to me, that was worth whatever painful aspects it had, which of course it had some. Um, as an outsider, I just assumed you got everything 100% right, but did you hear from any people, oh, you got that wrong, you got that wrong? <laughs> just this week. Oh, for the first time? I said week. that Megan graduated in Posthumously in 2001, it was 2002. I can't believe it. I didn't do my arithmetic. But in terms of bigger things, there are bigger things than facts. Truth is bigger than fact. Um, no, nobody has said to me, to my face, anything but you nailed it. Um, Maggie's family has told me that some, Maggie's parents have been very. Um, instrumental in the, in the process of writing the book and, and great support to me after the writing of the book. And they told me there, there are those in the extended family who think that I was too sympathetic to the young man who killed her. Um, I don't know if that constitutes getting it wrong. I think, I think what, they're, what they're saying is more political. You, you shouldn't, no matter what the truth is about him, you shouldn't make him look sympathetic. So, it seems like a pretty good, you know, yeah. average. Yeah, but no, nobody, nobody has said you really misread this or you really portrayed this person wrong or said something about the college that isn't true. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I Catherine. You read all those letters. And thinking about today's world and, you know, we email and I do send email letters to my kids and they'll say, well, that's so long, you know. They want to they want to ask Yeah, that's so long. Yeah. Uh, and, and I've seen, I've heard from a couple of my Japanese friends uh, after the problems over there. And some of them are short, but one wrote me a uh, page and a half. These are all Western brands. So uh, I'm worried, I mean, what our future writers are going to do. Uh, um, well, because they're not going to have this right, packet right, of letters yeah, to read. I know. Uh, and, and you know, I, I can't throw away anything at home. I mean, every piece of paper that I have, I think, oh, it should be saved in the world. Not that I think anybody, they might be interested in it in a way that we can't even imagine. But yes, I'm very keen on that. I, I noticed this week that um, all my colleagues are now switching to Gmail because they're all going to get in trouble, you know, for using their university addresses. And, and then all the stuff can never disappear. And they're all worried about it. And I'm very excited about the fact that it can never disappear. Because what that means is that for future scholars, is think of all this stuff. Where does it go? Where is it? Wouldn't it be fun to be able to, you know, resurrect all of it, you know? So it may be that the 
future will hold more text than we think. But now your other argument about young people not wanting to write long letters, I'm married to Tom Bailey, and he complains about that. Every morning he goes to the computer and he goes, <sighs> and it's because he's written this elegant letter to somebody and he gets back some terse. But, um, yeah, the art of letter writing, the art of letter writing, I hope we're not losing that. Uh, that does, that does worry me. And I appreciate it when I get an elegantly crafted piece. Um, it's only that. Well, I don't know what the year will tell, but I print off all the letters that my kids write me on the internet, oh. and I have them all saved. No, 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 they're not going to be saved by the ones you print it off. They're going to be saved because you never lose it on the internet. Yes. Yes. Isn't that great? Right? Yes. I have, if I could just add, possibly the most valuable uh, find in my research was the complete um, electronic exchange between murderer and victim for a two month period, which the police pulled off their computers after the deaths and preserved in the police report. So it wasn't gone. Even if you can delete it, but it's out there forever. Even if you delete it, it's still in the cloud. It's in the cloud, that's right. I'm just a tiny ray of hope, perhaps. I teach creative writing at KCC. And yesterday in class, we were talking about snail mail. There was a poem that we read or something. And and I asked the question, how many of you like to receive snail mail? And they almost all raised their hands. They appreciate it. And one boy writes to his grandmother every month. Oh, and I just thought, you know, it is it has not died. Mm -hmm. it has yeah. Not. yeah, I don't really have a question. I just want to compliment all of you. I, I really was fascinating. And I, I want to compliment Marsha for choosing the people that she did because it's such a wonderful range, you know, that uh, we get from the journalistic to, you know, three different, totally different kinds of uh, writing. And uh, I don't know how many writers are in here today, but I think if you're a writer, you probably got a, a lot out of this. If you are a writer, you got a lot out of it. So I really appreciate it. Did, uh, Gail, did you say the that for forensic reasons they went in and got the hair? Yes. Yeah, I, it wasn't email, it was instant messaging, mm -hmm. which was really mm -hmm. popular in the 90s. Because they're, they're yeah. doing that yes. now yes. regularly. Yes. The first thing they want to do is get out the, the, Yeah, about 30 yes. pages of them in the middle of the police report. I was just fascinated. And it, a number of people have said to me it's just extraordinary to read those you, yes. because you get right inside how these two kids talk to each other. You 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 used uh, you spoke of uh, something along the lines of death charging in to shatter uh, lives, and uh, I remember my oldest daughter is now a uh, uh, psychiatrist at University of Pittsburgh, but she had uh, uh, she had been I think on the job in her uh, first year in the. Uh, Postgrad in, in a residency at University of Pittsburgh. She's now uh, faculty, but she had been there about I think six weeks and was on call one night when a uh, fella came in with a baby. Uh, uh, obviously, dead. He, he said the baby's unresponsive. Well, he had, it was his girlfriend's baby, maybe his too. And he had taken it by the heels and smashed it against the wall. And, uh, you know, the physicians, even new, uh, young physicians, are used to dealing with death, uh, and not always so easily, but to, to have it shattered into your life like that. And she called uh, my youngest daughter, who was a, uh, uh, was at the time, I think she just finished law school and she said what's going to happen uh, you know 
in terms of what I have to do in court. And they, she said, well, don't worry about it. Uh, uh, the hospital will uh, provide uh, legal counsel and will handle it. She said, uh, and don't get upset because when you're in court, even though you went to Harvard undergrad and Michigan med school and did honors, they're going to try to make you out that you didn't do what you could have done to save the baby while there was nothing to do it. But what I'm saying, it, death can come shattering into people's lives in the most unexpected ways. And, and that was the term I think you used, uh, or I heard you, you say. And the other, some of the others, I, I remember that uh, I think probably Kathy spoke of uh, the type of reading. And I remember at U of M, my first year they had uh, in a sociology class, they had us reading Elmstown Youth. I don't know if anyone else is, but it was a uh, a man and woman, had, uh, husband and wife had written it, and it was really uh, a made-up uh, story of, uh, you could call it anywhere in USA, it was supposed to have been a, a uh, f fictitious uh, city in the Midwest, but it was written so well that you could almost, it's, it reminds you of our town. Uh, that you, you can uh, uh, relate to everyone and everything that happens in the book. Uh, and, and yet it was done so well, it's almost as though, uh, you know, you, you, when I was reading it during that semester, I kept looking in, in the forward, is this really made up? It sounded so accurate of a, of a uh, and, and so they had done their job. They were teaching us stratification and how the dynamics of a uh, Midwestern town. I have a question about, as I'm writing nonfiction, often I'm writing about an event that I was part of, but it isn't my story, so to speak. I'm writing about someone else, like what you were doing, but I was, um, if I'm writing about people I know who are grieving or some beautiful moment that happened, is, is there, do you find there's somewhere where I, I should or writers should step back and and not have so much of me or us in it? Or how did, how did you, I mean, the story wasn't exactly about you, Gail, but it was about, you know, there's a point in the story where I got real active as a character. Uh -huh. It was the hardest part to write. I, that's, okay, well, that's my question really, is how did you do that? Um, <laughs> uh, hmm. oh, I, I, I'm not stumped, I have so many answers to what you just asked me. Um, I, don't think, I don't think pulling back is a good idea if what you want to say has something to do with your response to the grief. I, what I what I ask the students is you got to figure out what it is you're writing about. Are you really writing about that other person, or are you writing about the, the interaction with that person? Mm -hmm. Is it your story as well? And it usually is. Um, what I tried to do was incorporate in my portrayal of myself my ongoing ambiguity about what I did and how I did it and the conflicts that erupted at K after these deaths and how hard they were for me. Um, I realized I couldn't get any sort of detached perspective on that. Um, but I also didn't want me and my angst <laughs> about the politics of it and the way I was being spoken about um, to swamp the story. Uh, because I, I, I knew that readers would not be interested in that and that that was my hang up. Um, so I, I, I kept, I really struggled with that chapter. The rest of the book came very quickly and that one was hard. And I kept going back to try to get both of those things. Make sure your, your real struggle is in there, but make sure that it's just part of the greater story. It doesn't take over.